The story you are about to hear is true and is intended only for informational purposes. Some of the names, locations, and other details have been changed or omitted in efforts to protect the innocent. Today's story is about Philadelphia convicted murderer Naeem Davis of West Philadelphia, according to court documents on May 24, 2008. At approximately 1.45 a.m., a Philadelphia police officer responded to a radio call at 54th Street and Wyalusing Avenue in West Philadelphia. There he found the victim lying face down in a pool of blood in the street outside of a bar called the 54th Street Lounge. He also observed a woman crying hysterically, who was later identified as the victim's sister. The officer also saw fired cartridge casings lying on the ground near the victim. The police officer who was assigned to the crime scene unit arrived at the crime scene at approximately 3.15 a.m. Approximately one and a half hours after the shooting, he took photographs and collected evidence. Among the evidence collected were five fired 9mm cartridge casings, one live 9mm cartridge, a baseball cap and blood stains on the ground. All of these items were found within a relatively close proximity to the 54th Street Lounge. A witness to the shooting was attempting to enter the bar. Shortly before the shooting and witnessed the killing, he testified that in order to enter the bar, he must press a buzzer at the front door. As he attempted to press the buzzer, he looked through the door and saw some young ladies fighting. He further stated that they were no more than a few feet from the door. The witness stood there for about a minute waiting to enter the bar. When all of a sudden the women along with Naeem Davis and the victim came barreling out the door. The witness testified that Mr. Davis came out backwards towards the door and when he came out, he fell over the steps. He also testified that Mr. Davis fell towards the curb near the sewer and Mr. Davis was half on the sidewalk and half out in the street near the sewer. The witness described Mr. Davis to be in a rage. He further testified that Mr. Davis picked up a semi-automatic gun which was on the pavement. He cocked it and walked towards the victim. The victim threw his hands in the air and said, I was only trying to break up the fight. Mr. Davis then shot him repeatedly and then ran away. The victim was also at the bar with his male cousin that evening. The cousin testified that he knew Mr. Davis from the area and that Mr. Davis's jaw was wired shut because it had been broken a few weeks earlier. The cousin testified that he arrived at the bar that evening with the victim and the victim's sister. When they arrived at the bar, Mr. Davis was already there sitting with a female. About 15 minutes after they entered the bar, the victim stepped on the shoe of the woman with whom Mr. Davis had been sitting with. Because the victim stepped on the woman's shoe, an argument started between that woman and the victim. The victim's sister then became involved in the argument which escalated into a hair-pulling fist fight between the two women. The victim's male cousin and Mr. Davis tried to break up the fight by pulling the women apart. Mr. Davis grabbed the victim's sister. The victim then reacted and said, Don't put your hands on my sister and punched Mr. Davis. The fight between the two men and between the two women continued as the four of them fell out the door and onto the sidewalk. Eventually, the male cousin stepped between Mr. Davis and the victim. He then attempted to stop the fight between the women. While he was stopping the women from fighting, he heard gunshots. When the gunshots ended, he turned around and saw his cousin lying on the ground dying. And he saw Mr. Davis running away. About 15 minutes after the shooting, a police officer responded to a radio call and arrested Mr. Davis just a few blocks away from the crime scene. When confronted by the officer, Mr. Davis told him that his name was Marquis Burgess. He also gave the officer a fake address, date of birth, and social security number. Another police officer testified that later during the morning after the shooting, he was assigned to secure Mr. Davis's home, which was near the bar while police were obtaining a search warrant. While sitting outside the home, a woman came from the house next door. She took the officer to the rear of the home where the officer saw and recovered a semi-automatic black 9mm handgun sitting on a barbecue grill. A police detective interviewed Mr. Davis after he was arrested, given his Miranda rights and consented to give a statement. In that statement, Mr. Davis admitted to shooting the victim with a 9mm handgun. He stated that he went to the bar to spend time with a woman. While they were sitting in the bar, he saw the victim, the victim's cousin, and a woman enter the bar. 
Mr. Davis stated that he then left where he was sitting to go to the bathroom. When he came back, he saw the victim arguing with his female companion. Mr. Davis asked the victim what was happening and the victim started yelling at Mr. Davis. Eventually, the victim's sister injected herself into the argument and started arguing with Mr. Davis's female companion. According to Mr. Davis, the two women started fighting then the victim punched Mr. Davis, causing him to stumble out of the door and fall onto the ground. Mr. Davis stated that his gun fell out of his pants and when he started to get back up the victim and his cousin were right on him. Mr. Davis further stated that he laid back over the gun. As both the victim and his cousin stood over him yelling at him, he got up, grabbed the gun and put it back into his pocket. He also stated that he asked the victim why did he hit him. Mr. Davis then stated, quote, And then he just started coming towards me again so I pulled out my gun and started shooting. Mr. Davis admitted leaving the bar and hiding the gun in his neighbor's grill. The medical examiner testified that the victim was shot twice penetrating his body. He also may have been grazed by a third bullet on his right arm. One penetrating wound entered the victim's body on the right front part of his neck. Gunpowder on the victim's body indicated that the gun was fired from a distance of approximately three feet away. The bullet passed through the victim's right lung and exited through his right upper back. The path of the bullet was front to back and downward. This bullet proved to be fatal. The second bullet entered the victim's left upper back and exited at the top of his right shoulder. This wound by itself was not necessarily fatal. The medical examiner testified that the victim's wounds were consistent with the victim standing facing the shooter, approximately three to five feet away, being shot in the neck, turning away and then being shot in the back. A firearms expert with the Philadelphia Police Department examined the ballistics evidence recovered and determined that the fired cartridge casings were all fired from the gun recovered from the barbecue grill. It was later discovered that Mr. Davis did not have a valid license or permit to carry a firearm in Pennsylvania. At his trial, Mr. Davis called the woman that he was with at the bar that night to testify in his defense. However, the trial court judge found her to be evasive, belligerent, and unbelievable. Mr. Davis admitted in his testimony at trial that he shot the victim. At one point, Mr. Davis testified that the victim knew that his jaw was broken and he threatened to break the other side of his face. During the argument in the bar, he further testified that the men threw him out of the bar and into the street, where the victim and his cousin began hitting him which caused him to fire his weapon. Mr. Davis also testified that he knew that the victim was a boxer and when he saw the victim bending over him attempting to strike him, he shot at the victim, but he did not intend to actually hit anyone but that he fired the weapon to try to scare the men away. Mr. Davis also testified that he blacked out as he was shooting the victim. The trial court judge found that Mr. Davis offered inconsistent versions of events and testified inconsistently with his police statement. The trial court judge rejected much of Mr. Davis's testimony, but accepted his claim that he was relatively unfamiliar with the gun and that he did not specifically intend to kill the victim. At the conclusion of Mr. Davis's trial, he was convicted of third-degree murder carrying a firearm on the public streets of Philadelphia and possessing an instrument of crime. On October 2, 2009, the trial court judge sentenced Mr. Davis to 20 to 40 years in a Pennsylvania state correctional institution. Following his conviction, Mr. Davis appealed to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court stating that he did not have effective counsel due to his lawyer failing to call a particular witness at his trial or sentencing hearing. Mr. Davis argued that the witness would have corroborated his testimony that he had broken his jaw in a fight weeks prior to the shooting and that the victim and his cousin were hitting Mr. Davis on his jaw. Mr. Davis also argued that the witness would have testified that he heard the gunshots and saw Mr. Davis getting up from where he was lying on the ground after the shots were fired. Despite his appeal to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Mr. Davis continues to serve his 20 to 40 year sentence in a Pennsylvania state correctional institution. The story you just heard was true and is intended only for informational purposes. Some of the names, locations, and other details have been changed or omitted in efforts to protect the innocent.